Welcome to the monthly truck stop webinar presented by the transportation risk specialist. These webinars are presented every second Thursday of each month at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This is Tommy Rook and we welcome you to uh, this program. We do do CE programs each first and third Thursday of each month. This program is not qualified or filed for CE. It's intended to bring you current happenings in the trucking and transportation industry so that you will know more about your clients and be better able to provide them insurance. If you are any questions, please post them in the chat window. Uh, they will be answered as time allows here or later we will email it and share you the answers with everybody. If you have a problem hearing, please send us a note in the chat window or call our office at 800-741-4084. We will attempt to correct any problems as soon as uh, we can. This is the Uniform, Care, Uniform Registration System Final Rule webinar. It's been long awaited. The completion of combining requirements for motor carriers to register, pay a fee, and prove, prove financial responsibility. This new rule will affect all users of vehicles 10,000 GVW or larger. When a motor carrier approaches someone to provide them insurance, the first and most important service provided to them is to get them legal. That is a requirement to meet all the government requirements for that motor carrier or that insured. This is what we're using a that this is what makes using a commercial motor vehicle different than any other insured. That's dealing with the government. You cannot provide insurance to motor carriers unless you understand the government imposed regulations. In other words, you must know your customers. And that is the overall purpose of the Transportation Risk Specialist and the Motor Carriers Insurance Education Foundation is to keep participants and members current on what's happening to their customers uh, no matter if they're an insurance carrier, a wholesaler, or a retail agent, so better able to serve those customers who are motor carriers, their insurance. Regulation. It started in 1935 with something called the Interstate Commerce Commission. It was heavily regulated. The ICC provided exclusive rights, meaning that not everyone could haul for any shipper they wanted to. They had to make an application and provided rights to haul certain commodities. Again, not general commodities, but specific commodities like food goods, textiles, machinery, over certain routes. The authority that is provided is to serve certain shippers. In fact, the authority itself is for public convenience and necessity, meaning to assist the shippers and, to, uh, and because it was necessary for them to haul it, meaning controlling their competition. Rates and performance was controlled by the ICC, by the government. And in this time frame, focus was on commerce to better able to have a system that will be predictable and provide people who are hauling consumer goods. Again, not raw goods like vegetables and fruit and things like that, but processed goods, consumer goods. That was the purpose here. That went on until 1980. 1980 is the landmark this change in regulation. After 1980, the big first big key is that franchises were no longer exclusive. This increased the number of motor carriers because of the ease of entry. This also kept freight rates low. In fact, freight rates stayed low until sometime in the 2000s, almost 20 years, and motor carrier did not get a significant rate increase for providing the services. Introduced higher limits of coverage from the 300,000 prior to that. To the new financial requirements, and also to 750, a million or five million, depending on the nature of the product being hauled, and the financial requirements of the MCS 90. The next landmark date is 1996. This is the ICC Termination Act of 1995. It was effective January 1st, 1996. Basically, the 
CC was gone. Therefore, all the previous enforcement focuses on commerce had been gone away. People there did not know the previous purposes of the interstate commerce. The oversight of transportation was moved to the Federal Department of Transportation, the Federal Highway Administration, and then later their FMCSA, which stands for the Federal Motor Carriage Safety Administration. The previous focus was only on motor carriers who transported consumer goods, the ones that had an MC number. Now FMCSA's focus was now on safety and all users are commercial motor vehicles depending no matter what was being hauled and who owned what was being hauled. That required DOT to combine the required regulation, DOT number, MC number, and state requirements into one. And the act, the law required this for DOT to do this in two years from the January 1st, 1996 effective date of the Termination Act. The ICC Termination Act that was effective January 1st, 1996 also redefined motor carrier to more than the four higher hauling of consumer goods. That was the previous focus of the ICC. They said there's no longer a common and contract distinction. And they also include private carriers in the definition of motor carriers and the oversight now being imposed by the FMCSA. However, even with that law change, the federal government registration system did not change. In other words, you could still register as a common or contract carrier. And for a long period of time, the sorting out of what these requirements meant and did were uh, a lot of discussion because there was a conflict between what the law said and the actual, the actual enforcement and procedures in provided by the FMCSA. The, so the law stated one thing, but compliance reflected something else. Because of the definition of the motor carrier, ISO introduced the motor carrier's coverage form. In other words, now that we have all moved to it because of recent changes by ISO, the form was actually developed in anticipation of this act and was filed by ISO in 1994. In fact, we had been discussing it since 1996 in anticipation of this. The old trucker's policy, or the trucker's policy, was only applicable to be used for four hire truckers. The motor carrier coverage form is appropriate for anyone who provides transportation, including the four hire trucker. The law had a lot of words, but it did not affect many changes. Does this surprise you or anyone that DOT did not meet Congress's deadline? Then, for some reason, 10 years later, the Safety, Accountability, Flexibility, Efficient Transportation Act, a legend for users of 2005, commonly called Safety Loop. Yes, 10 years later, the DOT took the steps that were required in the ICC Termination Act of 1995 that they were supposed to do in two years. The changes were new registration requirements which restricted state's ability to require interstate motor carriers to register and pay a fee to the states as well as state financial responsibility requirements. Previous to this, a motor carrier going through various states would have to meet not only the federal requirements but the state requirements. That was done away. There was also a new fee restructure and an introduction of proof of financial responsibility. The motor carrier meets the federal regulation to operate as an interstate motor carrier. They use this registration to meet the requirements, including financial responsibility, at the state level. The states previously had a system called the bingo stamp system. This, dealt, this required the motor carrier to deal with every state, to send every state that was a part of this system a proof of financial responsibility, mainly a Form E, and buy a stamp, in other words, pay a fee. and when the motor carrier entered that state, they would have to prove they've done that. This was changed to the single state registration system. The big change here is that instead of having to deal with every state like the bingo stamp required, you dealt with one state, mainly your base state. This was effective in 1994. 
it made it easier, but you still dealt with a state. And also, in both cases, they only applied to motor carriers who had MC numbers. Again, the people that the ICC had oversaw. The single state registration system was gone in January 1st, 2007. It was replaced by this new Uniform Carrier Registration System. The Uniform Carrier Registration System still is state-based, meaning you dealt with the state, but applies to all motor carriers that are federally registered, private and for hire. And the fees are are all that have been and the fees are all that have been set. States cannot impose requirements on a federal registered interstate carrier for intrastate operation. Those who have complied with UCR uh, and are interstate carriers. This did not affect the intrastate requirements, meaning motor carriers who dealt only with one state or who are domiciled in the state, just the interstate motor carriers. The single state registration system was deactivated January 1, 2007. In other words, the fees were stopped because the main purpose of the single state registration system was to collect fees that were sent to the states to enforce the uh, federal regulation. After six months of no fees, the UCR board told FMCA that they would not address the financial responsibility element, but only address the fees. The states were having were shutting down or at least uh, rolling back their enforcement. They were uh, furloughing people because they did not have the and in some cases even borrowed money from other states to keep the enforcement going. So the board then just addressed the fee part and imposed fees starting in the last quarter of 2007. What the fees were were the fees that the single state registration system collected in the previous year, about a hundred million dollars. However, the big difference was the past fees were only paid by motor carriers who had MC numbers, and they only they counted all units the motor carrier had. The new fees were imposed on all holders of the OT numbers. Exempt and private are now required to pay a fee, and they count only intrastate uh, interstate trucks not intrastate trucks. The fees were important. States needed the money to meet the requirements to enforce federal safety rules. But there was a shortfall. They never collected the $100 million for the, in the first fees. There were five brackets with the lowest being someone was zero to two trucks. The reason you have zero is because freight forage and brokers were also required to pay fees were $39 was the lowest and in the top bracket for motor carriers with more than a hundred and a thousand and one trucks, the fees were thirty seven thousand five hundred. There were about a hundred and seventy thousand motor carriers with MC numbers who paid the previous fees. Now all holders of DOT numbers, about seven hundred thousand were to pay the fees. So why were there shortfall? Well first off there are not 700,000 active MC number, MC motor carriers with the OT numbers. In fact, when the state sent letters out to start the collection process, a high number of the letters came back, address E unknown. Plus, if you all remember, this was the start of um, the process through the economy slowdown where there were fewer truckers and fewer trucks on the highway, so therefore less fees. So the federal government increased the fees to seventy-six thousand again at or excuse me seventy-six dollars again at the lowest bracket to seventy-three thousand three hundred forty-six at the highest bracket. They also outsourced the registration to the Indiana DOT. The federal government did not want to assume any uh, obligations, so they outsourced the various states most of these functions. The four hire motor carrier paid in the past and paid under the new system. And so when the fees were raised, they said, whoa, whoa. Now for four hire carriers said, don't increase fees until all people who are supposed to are paid. A number of private motor carriers who were required to have a DOT number and pay a fee slipped through and crossed state lines. 
This was less, these were usually people with le using vehicles less than 10,000 GBW. Remember all users of units 10,001 GBW or larger, meaning six wheels, not 18 wheels, interstate commerce must have a DOT number and pay a fee. So not all private carriers with DOT numbers paid and many who required to have a DOT number because of not being an 18 wheel, wheeler slipped through not paying fees, therefore a shortfall. So here we are with the completion of the Uniform Carry Registration System to address not only the shortfall but also the financial responsibility requirements. This first rule was published in, Jan in November 2011 and we uh, summarized a blog on this on April 1, 2013 that you can go into our website and see what those changes were. The blog was titled Changes in the UCR. The final rule came out August 16, 2013, just last week. We wrote a blog concerning this to give you alert to this and also in preparation of this webinar. So after almost 15 years, what was mandated in the ICC Termination Act of that date's wrong, 19 95 is now being completed. Things don't change quickly. Even with the new law, the completion will take two more years. That is, if the CSA doesn't push back. One of the problems that we have in all this new enforcement is that the government is in a very in a mode of restricting uh, programs because of lack of dollars yet this new program is uh, in force and how to enforce it and are they going to meet these deadlines will be a question that we will be looking at for the next two years. So we're back to the future. The IC Termination Act of 1995 mandated the DOT to come up with a single registration system for motor carriers instead of the present three. They were given two years to complete. Well, ten years later, the FMCSA is now addressing the registration system. The, the stated purpose is to consolidate and simplify current federal registration process and to increase public accessibility to data about motor carriers, property brokers, and freight forwarders. The key part here is public accessibility to these data. The original safety loop bill was passed. Uh, in January 20, 29, 2005 and signed by President Bush and it was a public law. Uh, there was a, a, the, now we have finished this completion with the final rules published in 2013 with a two-year phase-in time frame. The revised registration system is going to replace the OP1 which is to get an MC number and the MCS150 to get the DOT number with a new registration form, the MSA-1, MSA-1. The UCR is to replace the current DOT identification system, the single state registration system, and the uh, motor care authorization, the MC numbers, and the financial responsibility. This new registration application is a 20 plus application versus the old OP12 or MCS150, which is a two phase, two pages. So it's more asking more questions. Let's look at the new law, the law that was just published. It is a, if you want to access the law, this is a way to do it. It's a 47 page document. If you use this process, uh, to look at it, I recommend that you might want to do it. We try to uh, briefly uh, describe the effects that uh, the law has on us as providers of services to motor carriers. The bulk of the discussion in the Federal Registry that was uh, published uh, August the 23rd, 2013 under rules and reg dealt with why the FMCSA took certain positions. They related to the public input, answered the public input, and came up with these final rules. So the actual impact of the law is not a 47-page document, but far fewer things than that. 
Uh, again, FMCC used this uh, the Federal Registry to explain why they did what the law now is requiring uh, to be done. The preamble to it is the Uniform Registration System, uh, the final rule. The FMCA amends its regulation to require interstate motor carriers, freight forwarders, brokers, intermodal equipment providers, hazardous material safety permits, applicants, and cargo tank facilities under FMCSA jurisdiction to submit required registration and biannual update information to the agency via a new electronic online uniform registration system. In other words, now they're only going to deal with this on an online process. The FMCSA established fees for the registration system, disclosed the cumulative information to be collected to in the URS and provides a centralized cross-reference to existing safety and commercial regulation necessitated for completion for compliance with the registration requirements. Another key point here is that they're collecting more data to enforce the safety. The final rule implementation statute provided in the ICC Termination Act of 1995, again referring to the print to the uh, original act and then the Safety Lube Act that was published in 2005, knowing this is a completion of those two previous acts. The UCR will streamline the registration process and serve as a clearinghouse and depository information on an identification of motor carriage brokers, freight forwarders, uh, intermodal equipment providers, hazmat uh, providers, applicants, and tank facilities, the people who are required to register at the federal level. Here are the important dates. The rule was effective October 23, 2015, except for, again, that's, again, over two years from now. Uh, this is except for the 319.19, and I went in and referred to this. This is the hazardous materials shippers and intermodal equipment providers identification reports. That's the updated information reports. And the 392.9B, again, those are people with authority uh, where the motor carrier is required to have authority if they use commercial motor vehicles, those 10,001 GBW or larger, interstate commerce. And notice here, under B, which is important and cited here, there are civil penalties for motor carriers who do not conform to this. And lastly, um, in the uh, those two items that I just mentioned, the uh, registration and the updated information is effective Jan November 1, 2013. The last item is the processing agent uh, designation. Uh, this was, uh, will not be effective until April 25, 2016. For some of you who have looked into SAFER, you'll see a BOC3 there now for four hire motor carriers. Those are the processing agents. Those are people that the motor carrier designates in every state of the union as now that they have interstate authority so that if an accident happens, there's someone in that state that can receive processing papers, in other words, papers where they're being sued within that state instead of going back to the home state. So two parts, the part of requiring everybody to register and to update the information uh, is going to be effective November 1st this year, 2013. The one part that involved in the processing agent, which we now is going to require more people to have a processing agent, will not be effective until, 2000, uh, until April 25th, 2016. The rest of it, and for our sake, the most important part of it is the financial responsibility requirements will not be effective until October 23, 2015, again, if not pushed back. The purpose of the UCR, as stated in this final rule, is to establish the uh, system required by the two previous acts. Uh, the ICC Termination Act directed the Secretary of Transportation to issue regulation to replace these certain things. The implementation of the URC final rule will consolidate the following registration information system. The USDOT uh, identification number system, those are people with DOT numbers. The uh, commercial registration system, those are MC numbers. And the financial responsibility 
uh, requirements as well as now introducing the process agent designation system, which was not addressed in the previous acts but is now being addressed here. The UCR will improve the registration process for motor carriers, property brokers, freight forwarders, again, intermodal equipment providers and hazmat applicants and cargo tank facilities to require registration with FMCSA and streamline the existing federal registration process to ensure the agency can move efficiently, track these entities. And here another concern is their purpose is to track these various entities, in other words, to find out more about them. The UCR also will increase public accessibility to data about interstate motor carriers, property brokers, and the various other people. And my concern, discussion here is how much of this information is going to be accessible uh, to the public. The new application replacing the 150 that requires the DOT number, the OP1 that's required for the MC number will be the MCSA-14. The final form is not published yet because there are certain provisions in the MAP 21 that required some changes. The UCR final rule applies to every entity under FMCSA commercial and or safety jurisdiction. Safety Lube required the UCR to serve as a clearinghouse and depository of information on an identification of all foreign and domestic motor carriers, motor private carriers, brokers, freight forwarders, and others required to register with DOT. Interesting that UCR will increase public accessibility to data. The MC is a one asks some additional following questions that the 150 did not. And my view in the future is to find out how much of this will be made public. In other words, the page that we all rely on, quote, safer, unquote, which is the mirror of the 150 report, will be changed and possibly additional information uh, will be available for us to look at. Because the MCSA-1 asks who owns the company, and it talks about the company contract, contact person, which requires the company to designate a person within the company to respond to inquiries. And then it also asks if you want to have an application, an application representative, in other words, someone else designated to those things. So we'll have the information concerning the company's contact person as well as the owner. In a lot of cases, those could be different. And their contact information, including cell phones, which are, uh, are, could, are not uh, required but are asked for, email addresses, and those things. And then the significant part here, and this is not uncommon to what's now, but the new application will emphasize this, and this is the statement that will be signed uh, by the uh, representative of the insured, the motor carrier, that that company certifies that all they are familiar with the FMCSA, they understand the penalties of paying, and declare that information entered on the report is to the best of their knowledge and belief true, current, and complete. And so when they sign this, this will be subject under penalty of uh, perjury for uh, misstatements made in this application, again leading them to civil penalties. It will ask for mileages, number of units, and number of drivers. It also asks for some other information that are unique here. We copied this out of the application itself, and I know it's hard to read on, on your uh, web page, but I will tell you the, what these are, and later maybe you can blow them up. The first one is insurance information, and it says, uh, do you currently maintain insurance coverage for BIPD, who your insurance company is? It talks about the maximum insurance amount, which is a little different than what we had before. Previously, the filings, we only put what is required. This is the amount, the date of issue, and the expiration date. The, uh, the big other key question that's asked here is trying to uh, weed out any possible people who are chameleons as being adopted by the FMCSA from the influence of the CAB, uh, Central Analysis Bureau who called chameleon. They're asking for disclose all relationships you have or have had in the past three years with other FMCSA regulated entities. This could be the form of of a percentage of stock ownership, a loan or management position. 
If this uh, requirement applies to you, provide the name of the company, the MC number, the DOT number, and the company listed safety rating. So uh, they must complete this, and that's a part here trying to find out if these new owners were involved in any other motor carrier and if that previous motor carrier had problems with safety. They're also asked for an individual and a contact number for the people who are responsible for safety. In other words, the uh, safety directed position there. They also certify the task measurement and verification that they understand the driver qualifications and that they are conforming to all the driver qualifications. The next page asks questions about drug and alcohol. Are they familiar with them and have they conformed to those things? Uh, it also asks about vehicles, uh, concern maintenance, and ask about accident monitoring. Now, the important part of all this is that these questions are subject to the previous statement that they must be answered correctly or be subject to uh, prejudice to uh, perjury from the uh, enforcement system. So. Will this, increase, will this increase truthfulness? I don't know. It does now ask for individuals who are specifically responsible for safety in a motor carrier. It does ask for the past history of the owners or principals of the uh, holder of this new DOT number from the past involvement with other motor carriers and their safety rating. All, again, under the purpose of safety, trying to focus on the motor carrier to be safe and to preclude their ability to wash out bad history with the uh, uh, by starting a new DOT number. And if this information is not satisfactory, then the new applicant will not get a DOT number until this is completely scrutinized and uh, that they can use and uh, approved. So the other question I have is how much of this will we know about in our process? As some of this stuff would be very helpful to us as we go through this to make sure uh, about our individual motor carriers. The next table, again, you can read that. It's for your information. Again, it defines uh, who has to uh, be involved in this part of the registration system. Again, for hire exempt and not exempt or motor private carriers, again, have to meet these certain requirements including uh, people who are hauling passengers, brokers, freight forwarders, intermodals, and those definitions and those things. Let's talk about the application process. The entities covered by the UCR will be required to register with FMCSA and update registration information provided on the new form, MCSA 1, prioritizing as required. Entries that already have a USDOT number do not need to file the form MCS until their need to replace registration information. That's the every two year the biannual requirement of when they update the 150 information. So when this process starts, the complete process for the existing people with DOT numbers will take another 20 months before completion. For you who have been to my previous, who have not been in my previous classes, or you who have don't remember this, when a motor carrier has to update depends on the last two digits of their DOT number. The second from the end is the year being even or odd, and the end number will be the month, zero being in October, and nobody updates in November and December. So when this process starts, there will be some 22 months before or excuse me, uh, yeah, 22 months before it will be completely through the process. The FMCA is requiring that the regulatory entities fill out and update their registration information electronically using the web-based online version of the form. That's a big plus here. This paper form is extremely cumbersome. Maybe doing it online will make it easier, particularly as they have modified their uh, process. Under the UCR application process, a new applicant will be issued an inactive US DOT number. In other words, they cannot use it until they finish the process. The inactive US DOT number will be activated by the agency only after the agency has determined that the applicant is willing and able to comply with applicant regulatory requirements and the applicant has sufficient um, applicable administrative filing requirements such as evidence of financial responsibility, if applicable. 
and a processing agent designation. Again, this is going to take time, but what they're saying is they'll, your motor carrier will have a DOT number but cannot use it until the uh, FMCSA is comfortable that they understand the regs and rules, they're not chameleons, plus having the, uh, the proper insurance filings in place and the process agent designation. If the carrier also is seeking operation authority registering the, then the non-exempt for hire motor carrier only, those are the ones that are now have MC numbers holding process goods. The USO DOT number will remain inactive until all a protest file. This gets back to the public convenience and necessity that still is applicable in that area. Have been resolved and applicant has satisfied all applicable administration filing requirements. An application, an, an applicant with an inactive US DOT number is prohibited from operating in interstate commerce subject to those penalties. So that's a key component here is now the process is going to take a little more scrutiny from going to I want to be a motor carrier to being able to use that DOT number. Here is the rule that's enforcing now. The final rule requires all registered entities to update the registration information effective every 24 months as we went, just went through. When there are changes to an entity legal name, form of business or address registration information, it must be updated sooner. An entity also may update its record with the FM uh, CSA at any time within the 24-month period to provide changes to other information. However, such changes will not relay and uh, rely on the entity of relieve an entity of requiring an uh, entity of complying with the biannual update requirement. Beginning and here's the key component: November 1st, 2013, the agency will issue a warning letter 30 days prior in advance of the biannual update deadline to notify the entity that its USDT number will be disactivated, deactivated if it fails to comply with a biannual update requirement. So the pressure is on to update this. The final rule also requires all entities to notify FMCSA of any change to legal names, forms of business, or addresses within 30 days of the uh, participate of uh, uh, the changes. This requirement will ensure the continuing reliance and, and viability of the US DOT number as a unique identifier and repository of safety data associated with these particular entities. In particular, this requirement will allow FMCSA to monitor in a timely manner um, informational changes affecting all entities holding a DOT number. So this update is critical your insured will, if they don't update properly, will be deactivated, meaning they cannot operate. And if they do operate, will be subject to civil penalties and uh, will be uh, intervention by the FMCSA. Let's talk about the identification number. The DOT number will be the sold number. The MC number, MX number, FF number is going away. The problem before is that the MC number which is for the four hire carrier hauling consumer goods, process goods, was housed by Bopi Transportation in Cambridge, Massachusetts. The DOT number is housed by the Federal Highway Administration in Washington. And very simply, you had to merge these two systems. So when this process is over, again in two years, there will be only one identification number for all of these entities. There will be subclassifications within that one identification number, but there will be one identification number. The MC number will go away. Uh, the rule will not require the motor carrier to remove the obsolete MC number off the side of the vehicles. Uh, as you know, that hasn't had to be on the vehicle since uh, 2004. Uh, it's always been my uh, kind of interesting thing that even new trucks have uh, the MC number there. My comment has always been save the money, don't print it there. Uh, they do recommend here when the last part of this thing, the uh, agency encourages the carrier to omit these obsolete numbers from any new or reprinted, repainted vehicles. So here's a review. New form, MCSA-1, more information. Uh, require the insurer to be more truthful, to divulge more information, particularly past involvement in motor carriers who might or might have might or might not have a very viable safety record. How much of the information will be available to us, we'll find out. The requirements of every two years, which before had no teeth in it, will now will have teeth. 
Uh, this will be effective November 1st, 2013. That's not far from here. If not updated, then the US DOT number will be deactivated. Remember, this is all remember this is all motor carriers, all for hire and private users of vehicles 10,000 GDW or larger, interstate commerce, and then the DOT number will be the only identification for these motor carriers. There are are some filing fees here, uh, not much change differently here uh, of interest on this page is that the insured must file a $300 application fee. Uh, when the uh, making changes, it's going to cost $10 for us who are involved in insurance. When we make an insurance filing, or it's going to take a $10 fee. They have removed the reinstatement fee, which used to be $85. Um, now it's ten dollars, so they reduced the, the, that fee. The next component here that's pertinent to us is the evidence of financial responsibility. This final rule requires all for hire motor carriers, meaning before only people hauling consumer goods, processed goods, were required to have insurance filings. Now exempt haulers, people are hauling cucumbers, will also have to have filings, as well as private carriers who are transporting hazardous material in interstate commerce. Also property brokers and freight forwarders with the new bond requirements uh, that uh, we have uh, talked about uh, before where the $10,000 bond has been moved to $75,000. And by the way, for you who have not seen this, that effective date of October 1st has been pushed back to December 1st. I plan to get a blog out uh, concerning that uh, which you should have already received. The agency also requires certain private motor carrier transport hazmat and interstate commerce to file evidence of financial responsibility with agencies. These carriers are already required by statute. Here's the, 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 the conflict here. The MCSA, the Motor Carriers Act of 1980, the MCSA 90 required these people to have an endorsement attached to the policy. That endorsement was only enforced when the DOT officer came and visited the motor carrier. Now what they're saying is this is not a new requirement, it's just a new way of policing that requirement. So those entities that are using vehicles 10,000 GVW or larger in interstate commerce, if they're for hire, will have to have an insurance filing. And if they're private, calling anything hazardous, using a vehicle again 10,000 GVW or larger, will have to have an insurance filing. So this is going to impact a lot of new people. The agency and under the safety, uh, the, the safety Lube Act said that the secretary may require other people. But since that would be new financial responsibility uh, legislation, the uh, FMCSA has put off rulemaking on requiring all holders of DOT numbers to have an insurance filing. All they have done is address the current requirement for insurance and change the enforcement from passive knocking on their door to active making a filing. The agency is requiring filings of evidence of financial responsibility for all new applicants to be completed within 90 days of the date the application is submitted. The agency is not providing a grace period for financial responsibility filings by, ex by existing exempt for hire carriers or private motor carriers. Again, though, that will not be effective until 2015. FMCA is requiring insurance safety companies to, doing, to do all their filings based on a web-based process where today they would accept it uh, paper or other electronic forms. There are requirements for processing agent. Uh, this is, again, be able to provide services uh, uh, suits of services. This is not effective in 2016. Uh, we'll address those things at a later date when it becomes more uh, uh, important to us as we go through uh, the process. The completion date uh, for all of this, uh, again, is 26 months from now. Uh, that is uh, uh, no November 2015 except for the enforcement of the DOT number and the update of the uh, 150 um, information about the carrier, which has to be done by November 1st, 2013. And then 
with the processing agency being put off until uh, 2016. Uh, so there is a staggering of this. Again, it's not immediate. However, there are a couple things that are immediate, and let's look at those. Here are our current concerns. Update of the information. Effective November 1, 2013, the FMCAs will put in place procedures to deactivate DOT numbers when the information about MC, the motor carrier, is not updated. Again, they're going to send a letter, and uh, I question their ability to do all this, but the law says they will, so we'll trust that they will do it or we'll see what happens. When your insured gets that letter, they will be told they have to update that information. If not, their DOT number will be activated deactivated. So that's important here. The second part here is there's going to be more important. The motor carrier users of vehicle 10,000 DDOV or larger who do not have a DOT number will be subject to penalties for operating commercial motor vehicle, providing transportation, interstate commerce without a U.S. DOT number. So what we're talking about here is that now the, this applies primarily to users of small units, the six-wheelers. They were required to have a DOT number when they cross state lines. And so when applying for a new DOT number, which a lot of them will have to now with this enforcement because they don't have one now, it will fall under the new entry requirements, which means that they'll have a phone call to verify the information. They'll have a visit by a DOT officer to certify the certification of their knowledge about the regs and rules, as well as the policing of their insurance, meaning at this point, They'll have the uh, endorsement on the policy, MCS 90, later that will be moved to a filing. And again, their information concerning these motor carriers will be in SAFER. Uh, this will increase greatly the information that we now have in SAFER. I published for you uh, the uh, information you can get off the federal website that has the frequently asked questions here. There are seven of them. Uh, I would recommend that you go into the federal website at the sites that we told you before. At least download these frequently asked questions about these new rules. Uh, it will guide you and give you some uh, information that you can share with your motor carriers. And the second thing that we have published here, again, I realize is not easily read. However, you can go on our website and you can download all of this, uh, these pages so that you can look at it in more detail and share with your insurers. The second one is the biannual update requirements, and again, it goes through of how the UCR has increased their requirements of updating, and every two uh, 24 months, again, effective November 1, 2013, to restate again uh, your insurers needing to uh, to conform to this new uh, requirement. So that's the new act. That's what we're facing here. Uh, again, it's long awaited for you have been in my previous classes. You know that I've talked about these changes since the ICC Termination Act. In fact, the MCSA-1 application form that we talked about here was contained in material that we had as late as, uh, as early as, as, as 2000, and 2000 when these things became active. Uh, we took it out waiting for this final uh, part of this process. And even with the, new, the process, it is now delayed, and that is the insurance part of this process, at least the filing here. So let's wrap up. Let's take the big view. After looking for this, the completion of the ICC Termination Act is finally here. Well, not really, because most of the provisions have been pushed back till 2015. But again, 2015 in the insurance world is not all that far off. So let's talk about, first off, the new filing requirements. Even though it's not effective until 2015, currently for four hire exempt motor carriers, these are loggers, cattle haulers, sand and gravel who operate in interstate commerce, cucumber haulers, fruits and vegetables, and others, even lawn maintenance companies, will have to have an insurance filing in two years. Currently, they're required to have an MCS 90 attached to the policy. If so, then this will not, this filing will not be a big thing because the insurance company is already 
pledged the conformance with the Motor Carriers Act of 1980 insurance requirements, which will cover, uh, which will protect the public for any vehicle the insured owns, whether it is specified in the policy or not, and also has the pollution uh, coverage in it. But some of these people who will have a DOT number do not necessarily have the MCS 90 attached to the policy, but now will have to have a filing and this filing will have to be addressed. So as we process the renewals next year in 2014, we'll need to realize that these particular entities will have to have a filing sometime within the next year. This also is a private motor carriage. This is something that the audience or the people who are part of the Motor Carriage Insurance Education Foundation has always focused on or been involved in mainly for hire truckers using the 18 wheelers. This now is impacting all users of commercial motor vehicles, private as well as for hire, particularly if the private people, uh, is, this is the new focus here that's different than what we dealt with. Some users, six wheelers, they're not 18 wheelers, that cross state lines have in most states even have not been prioritized for enforcement officers to stop and make them obtain a DOT number which will, again will require them to complete the UCR and pay a fee. I, this provision of now additional enforcement here is to address that shortfall in the UCR funding. As a new DOT number, now that there's enforcement and civil penalties and pressure on the state to do this under this new final rule, as a new DOT holder, they will be subject to the new entry registration requirements, which will have the state DOT officer visiting them. This will change. Enforcement will be penalized and will become effective January 1st, 2013. That is now. So if you deal with with smaller with businesses that are private who are using vehicles with six wheels and those vehicles are crossing state lines, you need to go tell them they need to start getting their DOT number now. Uh, so that when they're ready to operate uh, and they can operate through January 1st, or excuse me, November 1st of this year, when this enforcement is going to be again kicked up and more emphasis here, they will, their business will not be interrupted. This you need to do. The insurance requirements, if hauling hazard material, one weed eater on a trailer behind a dually will require the MCS 90 attached to the policy upon inspection. Uh, because of being a new DOT holder, they'll have an inspection. The inspector will find out after 2000 and after October 2015. Then, of course, that MCS 90 will convert into a filing. So, in this year, the increased enforcement of the DOT number requirements will increase the number of DOT holders, and businesses hauling their own products will have their roadside activities subject to the CSA, and in two years, will have to have an insurance filing, which will, this insurance information will be made public. Again, effective November 1st, 2013, all DOT holders will have to have their 150 information updated. Currently, the only thing that happens is that if not updated, they're flagged in the CSA information webpage. You'll see a little orange flag, CSA webpage, it'll tell you that they have not updated the miles or number of units. To update information, they must have a PIN number. My question to you is how many businesses with a DOT number, particularly file, uh, private, don't have a PIN number? Or if they've had one, they've lost it. I mean, how many of you all have lost your PIN numbers or ID numbers? If you insurers do not have a PIN number, and that would be one of the things that I would suggest you communicate with your insurers, both a for hire motor carrier as well as the private motor carriers, do you have a PIN number? with the pointing to them that as of November 1st, 2013, it's going to be imperative that they update the information, which they cannot do without a PIN number to go through that process. To help them, we have uh, published in our, uh, and have had online uh, information concerning this. You'll find this in the Kingpin's archives uh, under the TSA webpage. Uh, it will be uh, the title is Updating DOT 150 Information Procedure. This will show you insured how to obtain a DOT number. It will require a credit, the credit card number that is that was used to pay their original fees and it will require some more information. It's not done electronically and so once you have finished the application for a PIN number, it is then mailed to the 
insured's address, which will take a week or so. Again, November 1st, 2013 is only seven weeks away. The good part about this is that since it is November 1st, 2013, the first time this information will have to be updated are people who DOT numbers in, in a even number, uh, the second one the in even, even number, and the last digit is a one. In other words, January 2014 will be the first time this information will have to be updated and the first time it will have to be enforced even though the reg is uh, subject to uh, November 1st, 2013. The situation though between November 1st, 2013 and the final rule is that there are some who have not updated today. If you go through and we have in our search to look at motor carriers as examples uh, concerning CSA, we find numbers of times where they have been flagged and how to correct that flag. So those ones who have not updated in the past will be what the first focus of the DOT officer. Again, they were supposed to get letters out. The DOT number will be deactivated. Let's see from the government how all that's going to happen but it is going to happen and we need to get ahead of the curve as providing services to motor carriers, particularly in the retail agent level and wholesalers to inform your retail agents so that they can talk to their insurers about getting the PIN number to be able to, uh, to meet these uh, new requirements. All these changes will affect our insurers. You can help them in explaining these changes, both as a retail agent, a wholesaler, and hopefully some of your company people and help the insured stay in compliance. Our dedication from the Motor Carriers Insurance Education Foundation and the TRS is to keep you continually informed of these changes and in particular how these changes will affect you, the providers of services to motor carriers, your insurers who are the motor carriers, and our insurance industry. So that's the overview of this. Again, you will be receiving a, over, a blog and some of those things so that you can share some of this information with your insured, which we encourage you to do. We'll remind you that the webinars are presented monthly, every second Thursday. Uh, so the next one will be October 10th, 2013 at 2 p.m. Uh, this webinar uh, is open only to our membership. Uh, if you're not yet a member, you can contact us at the address here and also know that this particular uh, webinar, as all past webinars, are available for view and for listening on our website, the uh, Transportation Risk Specialist website, which you can sign in as a member. Thank you for your attention today. We hope this is beneficial to you and we look forward to your continued support of this program and using this information to provide services to the transportation industry. We're out.